Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. I'm Sam Otten from the University of Missouri at Columbia. In the last episode, I shared the Thursday plenary from the recent PMENA Research Conference in St. Louis, Missouri. And in this special episode, we will hear the Saturday plenary from that same PMENA conference. PMENA is the North American chapter of the International Group for the Psychology of Mathematics Education. It's a research organization that began in a psychological tradition, but has since grown to include a wide variety of approaches to mathematics education research. You can learn more about PMENA at pmena.org. In this plenary presentation, Gloriana Gonzalez from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Tanya Bartel from Michigan State University gave a joint presentation titled, Empowering Teachers to Construct Problems for Their Students. They will share some insights from their work related to the problems that students get to work on in math class, and we'll also discuss some of the tensions that have come up for them. The next voice you'll hear is Dr. Gloriana Gonzalez, followed by Dr. Tanya Bartel. Buenos dias. So this talk uh, shows our dialogue. We talk a lot. Um, But we look forward to having a conversation with you this morning about empowering teachers to construct math problems for their students. So we come to this work with the premise or claim that teachers need opportunities to create problems for their students where they can tap into students' mathematical knowledge bases and assert students' knowledge cultural backgrounds and identities. I'm interested in studying how secondary math teachers use students' prior knowledge in problem-based instruction. When students work on a math problem, they make connections with math ideas that they have encountered before. But also, they make connections with their experiences about context framing the math problems. Math education theories such as the realistic math education framework establish that the context of a problem can provide opportunities for students' mathematical learning. Now, finding a context that is meaningful for students is really challenging. And some of the contexts that we find in math textbooks have the effect of disengaging students from math. Joe Bowler talks about make-believe context that only appear in Mathland. When students solve math problems that are situated in make-believe contexts, they actually need to disregard their prior knowledge and experiences. Paul Dowling's study of math textbooks shows examples of problems where the references to a context suggest that mathematics is useful for everyday practices. But in doing so, the practices sometimes are misconstrued and sometimes they're used as as a token or even promote stereotypes. So the search for meaningful context has taken me to look for culturally rich context for geometry problem solving. An example of a culturally rich context problem is the shadow puppets problem created by Anna de Jeunet and I. We were inspired by a textbook problem about creating shadows to teach the concept of dilation. A mathematician working on the project, George Francis, encouraged us to look for a richer context. So we use the context of shadow puppetry in Indonesian culture, which is called Wayan. And the shadow puppets problem is about finding where to put the light source so that the shadow is of a specific size. To create the problem, we interviewed a gamelan teacher and we learned more about Balinese puppetry traditions to incorporate these ideas into the problem. When we taught the lesson, we tried to make connections with students' prior knowledge, making shadow puppets or going to shadow puppet shows. We thought that even though students may not be familiar with wine puppetry in Indonesia, they would rely upon their prior experiences and possibly develop cultural appreciation through math. I'm currently investigating teachers' perceptions about using visual arts context for geometry problem solving. One emergent finding is that teachers value problems where the context is integrated with the math content. This means the student's knowledge of that context should help them to solve a math problem. At the same time, it seems that teachers see visual arts context as bringing other sorts of challenges. For example, since the purpose of creating art is different than the purpose of creating math, 
teachers see the imperfections in art or what people would see as imperfections as limiting students' opportunities to discover mathematical patterns. So the use of visual arts context is an example of the tensions between using math to model the world and using the real, wor real world situations in school mathematics. Good morning. Um, I'm interested in how elementary teachers gain knowledge about their students' lived experiences outside of school, as well as how they create or adapt curriculum or mathematics tasks or problems to elicit and draw upon that knowledge to further support students making sense of mathematics. My work with colleagues on the Teach Math Project, many of whom are here, for example, demonstrated that prospective teachers can engage in activities that support them in getting to know students on some level. And that many of those prospective teachers are able to develop in a methods course meaningful mathematics lessons that attend to children's home and community knowledge, as well as their mathematical thinking and mathematics, or what we have come to call children's multiple mathematical knowledge bases, or MMKB. In another part of this work, my colleagues and I examined over a dozen elementary curricula for ways in which they, as written, provide supports that open spaces for students to share or connect to their lived experiences, for students to use several mathematical representations or strategies to engage in problems, and for students to share and discuss their mathematical thinking. So as we were looking across these curricula, we documented that most curricula, many, maybe not most, do have those spaces, but they tend to exist in the peripheries of the lesson. They're the extension or they're a suggestion in the margin, and they're not generally the actual task of the lesson in the curriculum that we see. We thus suggested that teachers be supported in making adaptations to curriculum that rearranges lesson components to front load problem solving and consider omitting sections that tell or direct or show students how to solve a problem or to make sense of mathematics. Also to adapt tasks to open spaces to connect to children's MMKB, such as using number choices and encouraging multiple representations and strategies. And also making adaptations that make authentic connections with students' experiences and prior knowledge throughout a lesson. My work has also explored teachers learning to teach mathematics with, for, and through social justice. In this work, I've noted how teachers balance or negotiate both the mathematical goals that they have and the social justice goals that they have, as well as the need for teachers to develop or to have pedagogical content knowledge with respect to the mathematics as well as with respect to the social justice issues. With these in mind, teachers can be supported to create math lessons that engage with social issues of interest to students. Uh, more recently, Michelle Cirillo, Anita Wagger, and I argued for the potential intersections supporting students' mathematical modeling and engaging with social justice issues. We illustrated, using example problems, how engaging students in mathematical modeling may contribute to deep consideration of social justice issues while also enhancing students' engagement in mathematical modeling. It is imperative that students are learning mathematics and equally imperative that they are learning more about the world in which they live to disrupt oppression while maintaining who they are. In all this work and in our discussion, we also recognized several challenges or tensions that kept coming up for students, for teachers, for math teacher educators, and for mathematics education researchers. So in the next part of our talk, we're gonna present some of those tensions that came up in our discussions. And we present these not to say that we should abandon the work of empowering teachers to construct problems for and with their students, but rather that we should live within these tensions, navigating them uniquely across contexts to best support students' learning of mathematics. So a first tension that we note is between this idea of curriculum design versus curriculum adaptation. Curriculum design is pretty challenging. It's a pretty huge task to undertake. So asking teachers to create a math curriculum for and with their students adds to their already 
tremendous workload that they have. At the same time, though, it might directly speak to Nero Shah's provocation yesterday regarding whether and how we might imagine less mathematics education and more exploration of our world. On the other hand, opportunities to adapt a math problem or a math lesson so that it incorporates connections with students' lived experiences and prior knowledge might be more viable. It could be a way for teachers to learn about ways to bridge students' experiences and mathematics. It reflects efforts integrating justice and equity with the everyday practices that teachers are engaged in, like lesson planning and use of curriculum materials. Those adaptations should also consider Macy Golson's call yesterday, for example, to think about how our classroom curriculum work supports seeing and caring for black girls in mathematics. We also recognize that this discussion is happening within the oppressive system as it is. So later we're also going to raise some questions to provoke further thought on these tensions and how they are situated within these broader systems. The second tension is about the choice of context for situating the math curriculum. Teachers can be pulled to center the math curriculum in their own students' cultures and lived experiences. On the other hand, teachers can be pulled to center the math curriculum in the cultures and lived experiences of other people who are not represented in their classrooms. We ask whose cultures and lived experiences are represented in the context that we choose for math problems and why do we choose those contexts? When contexts are close to students' experiences, students can use what they know and share their knowledge with others. This is an important step for validating students' identities and opening spaces for students to bring themselves to the math classroom. Now, when contexts are new for students, they can also be valuable by providing an opportunity to promote diversity and inclusion through math. However, the process of selecting culturally relevant context is complex. In my project about using students' prior knowledge, we created a problem using the context of Hopi and Pueblo pottery for students to make designs with reflexive symmetry. When we showed the problem to geometry teachers, one teacher anticipated that her students would react by saying, oh, Hopi and Pueblo pottery, like, what are you talking about? And I wonder, what does it take for students to work on problems that are situated in unfamiliar cultural context? How do we find contexts that are culturally relevant and engaging for students, while at the same time they're mathematically significant? The work of others in the field, such as Marta Seville's work about children's funds of knowledge, reminds us that we need to challenge existing notions about what is math and pay close attention to the development of mathematical ideas from students' perspectives and within students' social context. A third tension that we talked about recognizes that this work might expand how we think about what mathematics is. It challenges the notions of mathematics as culture-free and of mathematics classrooms as being politically neutral. Mathematics can be a tool to understand and change the world. We can engage in modeling with mathematics. We can find spaces for meaningful connections with diversity and social justice issues in ways that validate and enhance and embrace the multiculturalness of mathematics, as well as that of any classroom of human beings. And this tension connects to the ways in which the decisions that we make about what mathematics to explore, what contexts in which to situate the work, and other decisions made in classrooms serve to privilege some and oppress others. Teachers' work creating problems for the students requires them to draw upon other sources of knowledge besides their mathematical knowledge for teaching. Yes, teachers must have mathematical knowledge and pedagogical knowledge, including, including knowledge of the curriculum, but teachers also need to have special knowledge of their students, their families, their identities, cultural backgrounds, and communities. So a challenging aspect of this work is how to represent various cultures without relying on stereotypes. How to make sure that we're inclusive in the choices of context for problems without falling into tokenism. In that sense, that's why we need to question the significance of the mathematical ideas in a problem that is situated in a cultural context. That is, how, by using mathematics, we can describe a particular practice. 
And what mathematical practices can be distilled from an everyday practice? By understanding the duality between mathematics as a practice and other practices that can be modeled with mathematics, we may become aware of representations of mathematics in school curricula. Teachers who create problems for their students need to know their students. By knowing their students, we mean knowing their identities, their interests, cultural backgrounds, families, and communities. There are limited opportunities for teachers to know their students in schools, and schools may not provide spaces for teachers to deeply engage with their students. But we do have examples in math education about ways in which math teachers can engage with communities and families. The work of Julia Aguirre, Karen Mayfield Ingram, and Danny Martin provide examples about how to draw on students' knowledge and leverage their multiple mathematical competencies. We need more of these examples, in particular for high school mathematics, where teachers may feel less flexibility to adapt or change the curriculum. This work is also situated within various systems of privilege and oppression. So for example, much of the work in schools currently is in influenced by this neoliberal political context we find ourselves in. And the neoliberal agenda includes a focus on economic well-being and competitiveness. It reflects a shift from education as a social concern to education as a market concern. In the neoliberal context, curricular reforms were implemented, which reduced learning to bits of information that could be taught and tested. Efforts were made to reduce educational cost through moves such as increasing class sizes, and teachers' work was greatly intensified at the same time that teachers were isolated from the decision-making processes and from each other and were essentially losing their voice. Recognizing the effects of neoliberalism has, that the effects that that has on teaching and teachers, numerous researchers press for teacher preparation to support teachers to do the work of addressing normative assumptions in educational institutions and to develop competencies to teach and advocate for social justice. Teachers live this tension with things like requirements to adhere to curriculum pacing guides and to also implement equitable math teaching practices. To persist in their commitment to providing just and meaningful math opportunities for their students, teachers must have significant agency. They need to have the ability to access or create networks of support and strategies then for connecting to those everyday practices of teaching. As another example that came up in our conversations, implicit racial bias exists in math education. We've known this for quite some time, work of Danny Martin and many others. Recent research, for example, um, by Eric Jacobson, Craig Willey, and Amber Simpson, as well as by Dan Beatty, Corey Webble, Amanda Lowry, and myself, uh, demonstrates how teachers' racial biases influence their attribution of students' mathematical competence. So, for example, when looking at video of children sharing equivalent mathematical thinking and understanding, two different videos, prospective teachers used qualitatively different language when describing the think of, thinking of children who presented as black versus that of children who presented as white. In particular, their language suggested that even though it was the equivalent thinking and understanding, they perceived black students' competence to be lower compared to white students. So creating spaces that we've been talking about to connect to students' lived experiences, to explore multiple mathematical representations, to discuss their thinking, is moot. If teachers and students' implicit racial biases, for example, fail to see competence across racial lines. Work then to support teachers in identifying and confronting implicit racial bias in their classrooms, uh, perhaps with the assistance of the equip tool that Nero Shaw mentioned yesterday, is imperative to support this work. Across these five tensions, additional important questions remained for us. What constitutes an authentic connection to children's knowledge and experiences? Can any curricular adaptation truly reflect an authentic connection? What does it look like to determine authenticity across various differences? If curricula continues to respond to the neoliberal context of learning bits of information that can be tested, aren't adaptations in this same context likely to simply maintain the status quo? And how do practices such as these account for implicit bias or other structures 
that maintain this inequitable status quo. Given all of this, is it not more important to design curriculum that foregrounds the social justice goals, thus not merely adapting mathematics curriculum, but rearranging mathematical goals and priorities based on the teacher-student context? We need more examples of mathematics embedded in culturally relevant and social justice context. Math education researchers can identify connections between math content and relevant context so that teachers can draw on these examples for creating problems for their students. This is not an easy task, considering that some math topics could be more amenable to connections with culturally relevant and social justice context than others. A mathematical modeling approach could be useful in thinking about ways to use math to read the world. And this includes a need for video examples of such teaching and current work of scholars like including Mary Ragosa, Maria Zavala, Naomi Jessup, Gladys Krauss, Catherine Ye, and Theresa Donlevy are working on this very issue. Mathematics teacher education is to consider how to support teachers in learning about their students in authentic, deep, and meaningful ways, and using that knowledge to create relevant problems for them or to adapt the curriculum they are required to use in their schools. While teacher education efforts may be different for pre-service and in-service teachers, these efforts can have the common goal of creating opportunities for teachers to learn more about their students, including about their families and communities, and developing strategies for using that knowledge in the math classroom. The expectation for teachers to learn from their students will position students as sources of knowledge. This can change teacher-student power dynamics in the sense that classrooms are conceived as spaces where all knowledge, not just the teacher's knowledge, is valued and asserted. As math education researchers, we need to study the effects of teaching with problems that teachers create or adapt for their students, going beyond traditional measures that only pay attention to student achievement. The effects may change students' identity, teacher-student interactions, students' cultural appreciation, students' understanding of social justice issues, and students' capabilities to use math to model real-world phenomena. These objectives go beyond students' knowledge of math content and support students' development of their mathematical identities and empowerment. As math education researchers and teacher educators, we must actively work to identify and disrupt systems of oppression in math education, both in our teacher preparation programs as well as in school settings. So as we move forward against this new horizon, Frente a este nuevo horizonte, we envision our dream for math education. We dream of classrooms where teachers and students see math everywhere. Against this new horizon, we see classrooms where students bring their identities and their cultures to be celebrated and validated without losing who they are. Against this new horizon, we see new spaces where everyone is learning math from each other and learning about their lived experiences. Against this new horizon, we collaborate, creating a different math, and we see math differently as we collaborate. Against this new horizon, frente a este nuevo horizonte, we use math to study the world, and we use math to create a just and inclusive world. Thank you.